Good morning and happy Easter. He is risen. And your remark back to me is, he is risen indeed. Tomorrow is uh, Easter Sunday. I'm recording this about noon on Saturday. The day that everything changed. Easter is the celebration of the greatest event to ever happen on planet Earth that changed everything. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. There is nothing that affects us more than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So happy Easter again. We will be having services at 10 o'clock tomorrow out under the or out by the bus garage. Even if it's pouring down rain, which it looks like it might be, uh, we'll just gather and pray. You just keep your windows rolled up. We'll just pray together and go home. But if perchance that the Lord answers our prayers and we have a good day tomorrow, we'll uh, be at, uh, out at the bus garage at 10 o'clock and Glenn and I'll lead in the services and we'll celebrate Easter together. But if not, uh, we'll celebrate Easter uh, in our own homes or just by prayer out at the bus garage. So today, uh, I've entitled the message, The Centerpiece and the Masterpiece. The crucifixion being the centerpiece and the resurrection, the masterpiece. Or we just simply call it, as Paul did, the gospel. The good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul writes to us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the word gospel just simply means the good news and indeed, it is the good news, the best news ever, that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. He also writes to us in Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible is a book about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a book about God. It's a book about how God created everything, how God intervened into human history. He speaks and stars and starfish appear. Seahorses and mighty steeds, planets and galaxies. A 90-year-old woman giggles at the thought of getting pregnant, and she gets pregnant. A woman looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. The sky rains fire. The Red Sea splits in two. A bush burns, but it doesn't burn up. The walls of Jericho fall at nothing more than the blowing of a trumpet and the shouting of a crowd. A donkey talks, and on and on the story goes as God reveals to us uh, how that He is involved in human history, and we see and learn about God and about uh, His love for us. But the centerpiece, the greatest event to, uh, to change our lives, the center, centerpiece is the crucifixion. God reserved his centerpiece until the end. It was a cross. It had always been a cross. It's still a cross today. It's where God's justice met God's mercy and God's grace became free for all who would believe. An old Russian woman, devoutly kissing the nail-scarred feet of the statue of Christ in her church, was approached by a Soviet military officer. He addressed her by using the common term for grandmother. Babruska, he says, are you willing to kiss the feet of Stalin? Yes, she replied, when he gets crucified for me. 
She had it in perspective, didn't she? Max Lucado, and no wonder they call him the Savior, writes this. God collapsed. Somewhere in the narrow winding street leading out of the city of Jerusalem, God collapsed. His bloody back gave way under the weight of a large wooden cross. Nowhere can we see God more with us, more imminent. Here was evil at its most flagrant, the destruction of the best. And God didn't move a muscle. Why? He didn't have to. Christ wasn't losing. The cross Christ carried was a weapon he wielded. He attacked the darkest heart of evil. He walked into hell as a man swinging wildly, laying people out with his stunning sacrifice. He still uses it to pierce hearts. Justice asks so much. Behind the mercy that flows so extravagantly towards us lies an extravagant cost. On the cross, Christ displayed the fire of justice and the warmth of mercy melted into one act of atonement. They beat him within an inch of his life. They mocked him. They spit on him. They pushed a crown of thorns down on his brow. And all four of the gospel writers record that they drove nails into his feet and hands and the phrase, and there they crucified him. It was the subject of Peter's message at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was on the cross, Jesus bowed his head and said, It is finished. That which he had come to do was finished. The plan of redemption, the plan of atonement was finished. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ indeed is the centerpiece of the Bible. But what does it mean? What does the crucifixion of Jesus mean for you and I today? Peter summed it up for us not long after the crucifixion. In a nutshell, he sums up in 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Redemption. It meant that we owed a debt. Christ's death on the cross was payment for my debt, my sin, your sin, Paid for that day. Freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from hell. Because Jesus paid my debt, a debt I could not pay, I don't have to pay it. I no longer owe a debt. I'm not guilty anymore. If indeed my faith has been placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing in all of history even remotely compares to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. When the God of creation, the God who just spoke and all that exists came into, came into being, loved me and you enough that he died on a cross, that he gave his own life as a sacrifice, as an atonement, as a redemption, where everything was made peace again with God. You and I can have peace with God. The centerpiece is the crucifixion, but the masterpiece 
is simply what Paul called the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles and want to read with me, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is the longest um, um, verses in the Bible about the, the crucifixion and what it means about the resurrection. The Gospels give us the story. Paul tells us what it means. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. As I've already said, good news, the greatest news, the best news we've ever heard, that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you stand, by which also you are saved. It's good news because it's by the gospel that we're saved. If, Paul says, you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. The gospel is all about believing. We indeed have to believe uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. That he indeed was God the Son, that he died for my sins, that his death, uh, sacrifice was uh, sufficient for God to, to uh, accept and that God accepted his sacrifice on my behalf and my sins have been forgiven unless you've believed in vain. So it's certainly up to us. We must give more than just mental assent. We must believe by faith that Jesus Christ did exactly what he said. And Paul goes on, he says, For I delivered to you first of all. Now Paul preached and taught a lot of things, a lot of important things. But Paul said that that of first importance, the first thing on the, on the list is the gospel. Everything else has to come after the gospel, after believing faith in what Christ has done on the cross for us. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. That's the good news that Christ died on a cross but without the resurrection, the cross would have just been another good man dying, uh, falsely accused for his crimes. But because of the resurrection, the gospel is the greatest news ever told. Paul goes on to tell us exactly the importance of the resurrection and what the resurrection means to us in uh, verses 14. Paul says, and if Christ is not risen, so if indeed the Muslims are right and Christ didn't arise and, and the atheist and the agnostic, those who don't believe in God or believe that he cares about us, Paul is addressing this issue. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is empty because, again, he's just another good rabbi teacher dying on a cross. Yes, he says, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins." That would not be a message of, of hope, would it? If all we had was someone who, who died a martyr's death, uh, many good men, good women have get, given their lives for a cause. But if that's all it was, if like the Muslim, we uh, made a, a trip back to Mecca to, to, to bow at a coffin full of dead men's bones, if all we had was a good person that lived a good life and he, and he died for a good cause, 
What hope would that give us? But in Christ, according to all the scriptures, according to all the witnesses, according to the disciples that, uh, that all died a martyr's death except John, and he died in exile out, out on the Isle of Patmos, men and women through the centuries have been willing to die for their faith that Jesus Christ indeed rose from the dead. But there's more. Peter addresses the subject again of the resurrection, and he adds something else to the story. 1 Peter 1, 3, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing to believe in God, for most of the world will say they believe in God. But then they define God as they want to define God, and that Jesus Christ was either just a good man or, in fact, maybe he was an imposter. He, he was a blasphemer. But the Bible puts Jesus Christ in the same, same verse, the same heading, the same department as God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So the resurrection is not just a good story. The resurrection is where our hope from, comes from. And Peter says not just hope, but a, a living hope. A living hope that our Lord and Savior rose from the dead. That He's the first fruits of the resurrection. And as the first fruits of the resurrection, all those that follow Him, that believe in Him, indeed will be resurrected from the grave. So our hope this morning in Easter is, this is not the end. It's not over. Death doesn't just claim us. The grave is not the end. The, this life is not over at the casket. We have a living hope, a living hope that's living now that helps us to get through every day. Our hope is in Jesus Christ that by way of the Holy Spirit of God that He lives in us, that we can uh, not just endure but overcome any obstacle. COVID-19 is not anything that's, uh, that God doesn't know about, that God can't handle. Uh, despair, discouragement, uh, death, whatever it comes in the Christian's life. We have a hope that Jesus Christ uh, overcame death, He overcame hell, He overcame sin, and He's our Lord and Savior living in our hearts today. And that's where our hope comes from. That brings about peace and joy in our lives. The more we learn about Jesus, the more we want to walk with Jesus, and the closer we walk with Jesus, the less this old world is going to mean to us. Think of it, walking hand in hand throughout our life with Jesus, knowing that He's there, knowing that He's uh, able to take care of us, knowing that He desires to take care of us, in the hope that one day we are going to spend all eternity with Him. Yes, heaven is going to be sweet because we learn that there's no death there. There's no darkness there. There's no sickness there. There's no pain. That's something to look forward to. Our loved ones are there. We'll go and see our moms and dads and grandparents and loved ones. And yes, that's something to to long for as well. But one day we're going to walk hand in hand with Jesus, the one who gave his life for, for us. When we had no hope, I mean literally, we were without hope. There was nothing we could do to gain God's favor. At best, our righteousness, just as filthy rags, we could do nothing 
And Jesus intervened. I wonder this morning if someone listening to this or someone uh, watching this this morning, if indeed you've believed in the, the gospel story, because, in fact, you do have to believe it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And with that, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that? Have you truly come to a place that you know without a doubt that you've asked Christ to forgive you of your sins because you've believed in Him? You've quit believing in yourself. You've quit believing in all the things that this world says it takes to make a good man or a good woman a good boy or a good child. It's not about you being good. It's not about the things you've done and how bad you might be. It's about believing in something that's unbelievable outside of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even that comes from God. By the grace of God, just God's grace toward you, you've, you've realized that Jesus Christ did something for you that you could not do for yourself and you reached out in faith and you asked him to forgive you of your sins and to accept you into his family and you've asked him to save you my what a great uh, time of uh, any time would be a great time but here at the Easter season for you to to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to know that one day that you're going to spend all eternity with with Jesus my prayer for you this morning is that if you've not done that that you do that and then Christian do we just take the story even of Easter as something we've heard and heard and heard it's just another Bible story or do we really bow our heads and bow our hearts and just pour out our our hearts to God and thanksgiving and and just worship him for what he's done in our lives nothing we can do to repay it Jesus died on a cross brutally beaten abused tortured nailed to a tree for me and for you that we might have eternal life in heaven Let's close this morning in a word of prayer and just thank the Lord Jesus for who he is and what he's done. Father, as we come into your presence with thankful hearts just to thank you for what you've done through your son Jesus. Jesus, we thank you this morning that you were willing to give your life on behalf of, of us, that you went to a cross willingly and died for my sin and the sins of the whole world. And all that you want from us is our believing faith in you. And we thank you and we praise you. We rejoice in knowing that, that you're our Lord and Savior, knowing that your Holy Spirit lives within us, knowing that heaven is our home, and that anyone who will come to you and, and just accept you, uh, Father, you just receive into your family. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, since you're on the computer anyway, just go ahead and go to YouTube and Google uh, Sandy Patty as she sings, uh, uh, we shall behold him. Kelly had to remind me. We shall behold him as she just sings her heart out because one day we shall behold him. God bless you. I love you. Have a great day.